Good evening. This is the March 8th, 2005 business meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. If you'll all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, yes, we have uh, one addition to the uh, communications um, and and some additions to the uh, coaching positions um, that I think you, the board members received at a meeting we had a little, uh, a few days back. I lost track of which meeting. We can just incorporate them into their normals. Mm -hmm. I have a motion for approval of the February school board meeting minutes. So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Elaine. Any discussion? All in favor? 6-0. And um, comments by our high school and middle school. Uh, high school. Yes, he's here. Oh, he is here. Play okay. practice. Play practice was canceled. <laughs> and middle school representatives. Good evening. My partner uh, in crime, Connor, is here tonight. He was sick today, so I'll be flying solo. Start off talking about some uh, news with the renovations going out at the high school. Uh, the main office is spending its last week up on the top floor where it is. Right now, it's going to be moved down to where the old health office was, right next to the cafeteria. So we wish them the best of luck in the move. <laughs> um, so I'm news going on in high school activities. The uh, one-act play, which was supposed to start tonight, was postponed, but it will continue tomorrow and on Thursday. Showtime, I believe, is at 7.30. About $3 to get in. Um, also, this weekend, the One Act will go over to Falmouth High School to participate in the One Act Festival. And we hope to advance on to states after performing there against other teams in our division. Also this weekend, there's the Berkeley Jazz Festival in Boston, which the high school jazz band will be participating in. And we'd like to wish them the best of luck. And tomorrow, the hockey team will head on up to Lewiston to play in what I think is the regional championship game. That's all I have for you. Who are they playing? Greeley. Do you know who they're playing? Really? Really. <laughs> Middle school. Good evening. Um, hi, I'm Elsa Long. Sorry, I didn't like um, at the school, the student council is planning Relay for Life and Spirit Week. Relay for Life is a fundraiser that um, the Cape Elizabeth Student Council will be taking part in. It's where you raise money and then go t um, tent out at the Falmouth uh, track and everyone at, in the Student Council will um, take turns and walk around the track all night. Um, for, sp for sports, uh, the track teams after a great start, it had the first meet um, last Friday and with the most kids on the team from any other school, the team did fabulous. With um, with great sportsmanship and um, turnout, and great turnout as well. Everyone seemed to have fun. Also, the Cape of the swim team is doing great. Uh, the fifth and sixth grade social was changed um, from like a regular social to just an open gym, and um, due to a few uh, reasons. And with the grades closing so, um, soon, many people, including me, are thinking of summer with the school going smoothly. It seems like only a few days since we last met. The school returned from February vacation and got right back to work. As I mentioned last meeting, spring sports have begun and winter sports are over. However, I'm proud to announce that the girls Nordic team placed first overall at the state meet and the boys placed fourth. Bugsy Malone Jr. is well underway. 
In the music department, we are lucky enough to have our school see a group called SOP, and I think everyone enjoyed that. Also, we are proud to send 18 band students to the Honors Band Festival and 11 chorus members to the Honors Chorus Festival, which was last Saturday at Scarborough High School. And on behalf of the students, I think everyone would like to say thanks to Mr. White and Mrs. Bean. We are also lucky to have a guest artist who worked with us this week on observational drawing. As you might know, all this week the eighth graders have been taking the MEAs. On March 31st, the eighth grade will be having another community day, and this is where the students spend a whole day with their advisory. Finally, yet importantly, the grades close on the 17th. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? I guess not tonight. Thank you. Move on to communications. Bob? Yeah. Um, we had notification of two additional teacher retirements. Um, in your package, uh, board members, there were um, notices from those two individuals. The first one is Susie Van Wy. Um, who, and the second is Julian Mullen, both of whom are planning to retire at the end of this year. Um, so wanted you to know about those. Um, we had a letter from Maine School uh, uh, Superintendents Association. Um, it was, again, in your packets the, that went to the legislature regarding the essential programs and services issues. The main ones that affected us were the last two in that letter, um, and I'll read those. Uh, the first was, in order to accurately assess the EPS impact, it would be useful to compare the results of having the FY06 EPS appropriation run through the funding formula utilized in fiscal year 05. And we, that is a request to the Department of Education to know how much more we're getting because it's targeted funds and how much more is simply because of the change in the, uh, the funding formula. The second one is there's a strong feeling that a printout needs to be produced detailing the individual unit calculations that were used to produce the ED-281. That's the form that we had in our package for budget. This information would be extremely helpful to superintendents and business managers as they utilize and verify the Department of Education calculation on the 281s and explain their unit's um, GPA allocation to their school boards, municipal officials, and constituents. We have been told that we will be receiving that. Um, we're not sure when. Um, we were hoping to have it, you know, by, before we got this far into budget, um, but we're hoping now to have it in the near future. Um, so those were the two pieces that most affected us. A, um, there was a, a uh, the next flyer in your packet was something called District Wise, which is a new publication. There was some, were some pieces about um, the different perspectives of students, teachers, and parents, which I found quite interesting. Thought you might as well, because we've had those discussions. Um, we'll see if we can continue to get that publication to uh, share it with you. I'd like to briefly read a section um, from a letter from the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital. It said, Dear Mr. Lyman, on behalf of the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital, I would like to extend our appreciation to the Cape Elizabeth School Department and the Cape Elizabeth Hockey Team for their support of the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital at Maine Medical Center. Coach Jason Tremblay played an integral part in creating the exciting and special fundraising event, Clash of the Classes, A versus B. It was particularly wonderful that the coaches and players embraced one of the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital patients, Zane Alexander, and had him dress up in the cape uniform and sit on the bench with the team. The smile on Zane's face and the appreciative words from his family showed how special this experience was for him. I think that speaks highly of what some of our, our kids and some of our staff are doing. There was also um, an additional letter from the high school guidance office. And I'll read at least the first part of this. Jeffrey Shedd, principal of Cape Elizabeth High School, is very pleased to announce that two members of Cape Elizabeth High School's class of 2005 
have been selected as candidates for the United States Presidential Scholars Program. The United States Presidential Scholars Program was established in 1964 by executive order of the President to recognize and honor our nation's most distinguished graduating seniors. Annually, up to 141 students are chosen from among outstanding graduating seniors to become Presidential Scholars, one of the nation's highest honors for high school students. I won't read the rest of it, but the two students who were chosen are Bethany Roy, uh, daughter of Don and Michael Roy, and Boris Vabson, son of Irina and Victor Vabson. So congratulations to, uh, to them and their families. Um, and one more um, similar letter from the high school music department. And um, it states that um, over the years, 23 exceptional high school musicians have won the Bangor Symphony Orchestra Main High School Concerto Competition uh, Annis Cup Award. Five finalists from a pool of applicants statewide are vying for the top honor at this year's concerto competition. The competition will be held on Saturday, March 12th at 1 p.m. March 13th is a snow date in Minsky Recital Hall, 1944 Hall, UMaine School of Performing Arts in Orono. Free and open to the public, the annual competition gives the public an opportunity to enjoy the talents of exceptional youth in the state of Maine. There are five finalists. Two of them are from Cape Elizabeth. Stephanie House on violin, a freshman, and um, Henry Kramer on piano, a senior. Um, that's a, quite a feat to have two out of the five finalists come from Cape Elizabeth, and our congratulations to them and their families as well. Um, we do have um, another letter um, requesting a maternity leave um, for Kathy Hamblin, and that will, of course, be granted um, under the contract. Um, that will go from um, approximately May 16th, as Kevin knows, and congratulations to Kevin on being a grandpa. Um, but uh, um, the due date is approximately May 16th, and she would be out till the end of the year. Um, and we also, um, and I believe that's all that comes under communications. Yes. I believe we have some others, yes. and I know Trish has one. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to publicly thank the um, music boosters, the high school music boosters, for all their efforts in bringing SOP <coughs> here last week. The performance in the evening was great. The group really um, connected with the kids. It was obvious. And from everything I've heard and speaking with um, Mr. White and Mrs. Bean and the kids, they were just um, a cool group, and they really inspired the kids. So thank you for their support of music in our schools. Thank you, Trish. Anyone else? If not, <clears throat> we will move on to communications from the public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone here to speak to a non-agenda item? Uh, Jesse Timberlake, I think, is here to speak to an agenda item. And if we can take it out of order, I would suggest we do that. I thank her for coming. Um, this is from the class of 1959. <coughs> yes. Good evening. Uh, I'm Jesse Timberlake. I'm from the class of 1959. I grew up in the Cape, I moved away, and I came back. And I'm here as a representative of my classmates who want to thank the town for the education and for the upbringing that they had in this town. Um, I'm also a representative to tell you that we are offering two gifts to the town and the community. One we have already um, garnered the funds for, and that is a bench, a granite bench, um, which will be a four-foot rectangular bench and I actually have some copies of it here. And it will simply say 1959 up in the corner. Excuse me, sir. Um, it'll be in memory of our classmates. It will go in front of our high school, which is now the middle school. And uh, I've been working with Bob Malley on a site. And I'm hoping that it will go up in the hill, overlooking our playing fields, or now the... Um, 
uh, playground, playground yep. and then overlooking, and then way out to the park. And then there are a couple of trees there, so we'd hoped uh, to do that also. So that's pretty much taken care of. And the second fundraiser that we're doing is we have um, consigned Rose Keneally to do a painting of the middle school slash our high school as we remember it. And she has um, done that, and that has been purchased from her. And we are going to be raffling that off um, in several local places in town and in South Portland. And the proceeds from that are going to go to some project at the high school. Um, I've been talking to Mark Tinkham about some ideas. One is a message board. And we're not sure how much money we're going to raise. We think somewhere between 1000 and 4000 So um, that will go. And that, we hope, will be something that will be significant to the students and to parents and to the community as a whole. So um, that's our way of, of thanking town of Cape Elizabeth for all they've done for us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have a question or comment? Yes. Any questions? Yes. I just want to thank your graduating class um, for uh, thinking back and remembering uh, where you grew up and, and the good things that have happened uh, to you. I hope our students today feel the same way. I hope they do too. <laughs> and um, I just want to um, also encourage you to, to follow as a class um, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation. I'm going to kind of give them a plug in that yes. They um, are, are looking to, for alumni groups yes. um, who feel as your group does um, so that other students um, can experience the exact same thing. We now have a website, uh, an alumni yes. website, and our members have been writing in. Of course, our class was the smallest, the last smallest class to graduate from high school. And I think we had 43 in our class. <laughs> and um, I went to Cottage Farm School. Um, this was my junior high school. And the high school is all that you see with the pillars. Oops, with the pillars, and then the top floor was our gym, and we had a new gym built our last year. So a lot has changed, but um, the feeling that we had growing up, the support of the community, and the incredible faculty that we have, we still remember the faculty, and we just lost our last faculty person last year, I think. Um, Derwood Holman was the last one of my, one of our teachers. And thank you for thanking me. And uh, we're all very excited about this. So thank, thank you. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Do we have any other comments from the public? Seeing none, I believe we've deferred our recognition until next month. So Bob, uh, we'll move right into the superintendent's report. Um, just briefly on the budget process, we have had our full day last Saturday um, session where all of the different departments presented. Um, there was a brief meeting um, as part of the Finance Committee meeting this evening, and um, the next scheduled meeting is still the 22nd, um, but we will see if we need another meeting before that, and if we do, we will be announcing that. Um, the uh, co-curricular stipend committee will be meeting on Tuesday, March 15th at 3.15. Um, and um, that will be the first meeting of that group this year. We are also have a scheduled calendar committee meeting for Tuesday, March 29th at 3.15. And uh, um, we need to work on that um, date if we need to move it up for any reason. Um, Kevin, did you want to do the appointment of the school board representatives to yes. two committees? Um, <clears throat> as I believe everyone knows, the town has established a comprehensive uh, plan committee that will be meeting shortly, and I have taken the opportunity to appoint Elaine Maloney as our representative to that committee. I know Elaine has the interest and the expertise to do a great job for us. Thank you for accepting, Elaine. And at the same time, the volunteer group over at the, in the schools requested a representative um, to their organization, and I have appointed Trish Brigham to that position, and I thank her as well um, 
for accepting that position, although she spent so much time as a volunteer around. I'm not certain that she needed an appointment. <laughs> Thank you. The last thing I have is that there was an article in uh, yesterday's Portland Press Herald, if anybody did not see it, on the, um, it was called Stressful School Standards Headed for Tweaking. Um, it was on some changes that are being proposed for the state learning results. Um, I think that um, it's very close to some of the things that were proposed here in Cape, and I'm glad that the uh, state is at least paying attention to, um, I won't say to us, but to uh, some of the concerns that have been raised across the state over um, trying to sort of jam this down people's throats and are backing off a little to give us time to do it right. So uh, um, I think it was an interesting article and I share it with you. That's it, unless there are questions. All right. Now for the entertainment. We're going to move on to school reports. And our first school report is a high school program report. Jeff, would you please introduce the yes. report? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, excited to introduce um, actually a first year teacher at Cape Elizabeth High School who is going to be here giving the report. So for probably memory, many of the board members, it's your first time to meet Evan there. Um, and I wanted to just tell you a little bit about Evan's background so you know who you're hearing from. Um, this is Evan's first year with us. It's not his first year as a teacher. Emma, Evan graduated uh, with a BS in chemical engineering from the Massachusetts in Institute of Technology, MIT, some years ago. Um, he worked in industry as an environmental <coughs> chemical engineer for about six years, I think it was. Um, and he then went to USM uh, to pursue a teaching degree, decided that that's the way, the route that he wanted to take. So he attended the ETEP program, the Extended Teacher Education Program uh, at USM, and got a job at Falmouth High School, um, where he taught for five years and became highly recommended to us uh, after he took a couple of years off from teaching as a stay-at-home dad. Um, Evan has a couple of children, uh, one of whom was just born this year, I believe. Um, and um, but he has so he has that important role to play as well. Um, Evan's only been with us one year. He's very quickly established the respect of students. Uh, he knows his stuff. Uh, he cares about kids. He works more hours in the school uh, than just about any other teacher in the school. Um, sometimes um, the race between Evan and I is you close the doors at night because um, uh, it's a good time to get some things done. But I think Evan is going to talk to you about. Um, laptops and specifically the use of a program called Geometer Sketchpad. Um, and one of the things I will say about Evan is he is a thoughtful practitioner. That is very clear. And he's going to leave you with uh, an experience with the laptops, an experience with the program, and also some questions related to uh, the use of laptops as a tool and when they're useful to use and when, and when you know, how, how teachers go about thinking about, okay, how do I use this as a really productive instructional tool? Um, and not just sort of splash and glitz and that sort of thing. So um, with that, Evan Thayer. Well, I, I do appreciate Evan, do appreciate some it. of us are going to move out of the way. Okay. I, uh, that was going to be my first warning, is that I have projection coming from both here and the overhead as well. So I'm going to take a minute to uh, turn those on. Um, the first part of the presentation uh, does not use the computers, but you're welcome to grab one of the uh, uh, eight or so that are most available. Those are the ones whose batteries are most charged, and if we need it, there's a knife one there as well. Let me turn on a couple of these uh, projection screens. Where to, where to base myself here um, as I run through this. I'll be speaking tonight on using Geometer Sketchpad, which is a fantastic computer program that uh, we have readily available to students this year because of our uh, investment in the technology. Uh, when I was first offered the opportunity to come here, 
uh, and I was thinking about what I was going to do, what I, what I had in mind uh, with the laptops and with the program, because it's so possible. It's just um, flash and glitz and lots of color and lots of animation. And to leave you with the impression, as you can see my struck out title, is that this is a dynamic software program, which it is, that will completely revolutionize the way that geometry is taught. Um, and it is, and it, and, and it is all of that. And yet, as I work to implement in the classroom, I, I somewhat have to hold myself back. Because the more I think about it, the more I realize that uh, this tool is so seductive that it can pull you away from other aspects of reasoning that I think are also important for the students to, to, uh, to appreciate. Uh, the, the bolded words in that title, inductive reasoning and, and deductive reasoning, there's a little bit of a, um, a polite tension between the two in the classroom, if you will. So uh, let me put up an overhead of uh, what I plan to do with you tonight, um, and uh, you'll see those titles surface. From a uh, non-computer standpoint, uh, early on, I'm going to try to give you insight into what the deductive and inductive methods are that we use in the classroom. Um, I would put forth that I think that the computer program, which truly is a fantastic program, is more geared towards inductive reasoning, to uh, more geared towards experimentation. Uh, but it is an incredibly powerful visual tool. I'm having you experience the flip side first, which is a uh, paper and pencil deductive exercise. Uh, that will be that, that second bullet there, and I'll get out one more piece of technology here that I love playing with every chance I get. Uh, that portion there will probably spend uh, 10, minutes, 10 minutes or so on, uh, working through a deductive proof of what I call a September theorem, meaning a theorem that you might encounter in September in the classroom. Uh, but then we'll do the exact same thing using the laptop, so using the Sketchpad program, to give you, uh, again, a sense of the, the, the power and wonder of this program. The more we work in the pencil and paper portion, the more the reward when you see how, um, how visual and fast a convincing argument can be put, put forth in Sketchpad. Uh, and then the last bullets will flow fairly quickly, I believe. So in general, inductive versus deductive reasoning, uh, the, the, the top of that, which you can't really see, talks about conditional statements, which we spend a lot of time on in geometry and, and in many classes. Uh, if, something else hap if something happens, then that implies that something else is going to occur. And there are a couple ways to fight for that understanding of, of what I have up here is, is uh, if A, then E. I want to get from one thing to another thing. And I've got a couple concrete examples coming up. I'll stay a little bit abstract for now. In deductive reasoning, through a deductive structure, we would spend our time learning definitions within our system geometry and assumptions of our geometric system. And then we could weave those definitions and assumptions into longer strings of conditional statements. So up here, up here I say, if A implies B all the time, and if B implies C all the time, and if C implies D all the time, then you weave that chain together and you can conclude that A implies E. That's a deductive structure. That is the standard of mathematical proof. It's worked and served me so well. Obviously, I like math, so I'm, I, I tend more towards coming to an understanding about things mathematically. But knowing in life that that's my standard of proof and that everything else seems a little bit short of that has helped me in my critical thinking, which is why I'm a very strong proponent of maintaining deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning, down here at the bottom, is more how we work every day, I think. We, we look at different examples and we say, gosh, in this case, A implied E, and in this case, A implied E, and in this case, A implied E, and we generalize from those examples to conclude that A implies E. But at most, this is just called a conjecture in mathematics, and it's just our, our best guess based on observations. It's a different standard of, of argument, if you will.
I'll stay up here for these because I, I don't want to spend too much time on them, but just in the interest of, uh, geez, these if-then statements, these conditional statements are out there. Uh, here's an article in the paper talking about if you eat lots of spinach and blueberries, you may halt your uh, mental declines. Well, maybe you arrived at that conclusion through your observations of rat A, rat B, and rat C, or maybe human A, human A, and uh, human B, and human C, to inductively uh, come to that conclusion that, as I've summarized up here, if one eats spinach and blueberries, then one may halt mental declines. Um, or maybe there's more deductive reasoning going on, and if you read the article, you talk about, well, geez, there are antioxidants in the spinach, so if you're eating spinach and blueberries, then you have lots of uh, antioxidants. If you have lots of antioxidants, then you will block the effects of free radicals and on and on, so you can weave a chain together that way as well. So in an article like this or the next one, you can see both the inductive and deductive uh, approaches at, at work. In fact, I'll even uh, skip the next one. Uh, now, this is the good stuff here. Uh, I have to say that the equilateral triangle up here is one of my favorites. The equilateral triangle has, has all angles of 60 degrees and all sides congruent. Uh, so those are the bold uh, segments there. What you can see in these thinner lines are called perpendicular bisectors. And what they do is, for each side in this triangle, they cut the side in two and they form a right angle with it. So you take this bottom side, that thin line going through there is cutting this segment in half, and it's forming a 90 degree angle. And I do that, I put a perpendicular bisector here, I put one here, and I put one here, and by golly, they meet. And that's kind of interesting. But I'll buy into the fact that they do it for an equilateral triangle, because there's just so much symmetry there. What a, I mean, it's a beautiful triangle right there. But we can mess with it, and we can make a less attractive looking triangle. Interestingly, it turns out these perpendicular bisectors will still meet, even if I put one through here, through here, and through here. They'll all meet. And I want to prove that to you. I want to prove that deductively. I want to prove that a implies B, B implies C, C implies D, to convince you that that's always going to be the case. And it's a paper and pencil exercise. Just to give you a forecast for the future, after we do this, then we'll crank up Sketchpad and we'll do it within a minute on Sketchpad. So in this deductive system of the a implies B, B implies C, etc. You've got to start somewhere. And where you start is you start with definitions of things. And you also start with some assumptions that everybody would nod their head and say, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll buy into that. And with those definitions and those basic assumptions that people buy into, that's where you start stringing them together. So here are some definitions that we need to all agree upon. And I'll just go to this third one here. If a line is perpendicular to a segment and bisects it, that's going to be a perpendicular bisector. We're just defining that. So we all go, okay, I'll buy into that. I'll buy into that perpendicular bisector, cutting something in half and forming a right angle with it. And in terms of our assumptions, there are two that I need to give you and just have you think about it and say, yeah, okay, I can kind of see where that would work as well. Uh, but I've got, my next overhead speaks to both of these, so I'll put the next one up. But I just, um, um, the start of our deductive process is that we, these first assumptions, aren't too much of a stretch for us if we think about it. So here are my two postulates. Um, I apologize for keeping my back to you here, but uh, if, here's postulate number one. If I, I thought about bringing actual physical objects to do this, but it didn't quite happen. If we're trying to make triangles, and, and that's an extremely enjoyable activity, if we take two segments and an angle between them, and I give a two segments and an angle to someone over here, and two segments and the included angle to someone over here, by golly, they're going to make the same darn triangle, because you just don't have anywhere to go. You take your two segments, and you stick the angle between them, and the triangles that you complete, which I've done down here, have to essentially be the same triangle. And so that's where we think about that for a minute, and we say, okay, if I can pair up two sides, and the angle in between them, and match them up equally with two sides and the angle in between of another triangle, I can make the conclusion 
that the whole triangles are congru congruent. That's my assumption number one. Great, I'm seeing a few head nods, so that's, that's a good thing here. The second postulate that I just want you to buy into is if I get triangles that are congruent, then all their parts are congruent. So if somebody tells me that triangle A and triangle B are congruent, then I can match them up and say, well, if the triangles are congruent, then, yeah, use the then. If the triangles are congruent, then these angles have to be congruent, these sides have to be congruent. These angles have to be congruent, these sides have to be congruent. Blah, 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 blah. If the triangles are congruent, then all their parts are. So we're ready to roll, because we've had a couple definitions and a couple postulates, so we're going to string them together to prove that in any triangle, those perpendicular bisectors will meet up. So our first string is a little theorem. This is, this is one of my early September theorems, if you will. And what it says is that if you've got a point on a perpendicular bisector, so we talked about this perpendicular bisector, cutting this side in half and forming a right angle here. If you've got one of those, then any point on it is at an equal distance from the endpoints. So I can look at that and I can conclude that segment ED has the same length as segment EG. And, but I'm, I'm hand-tied by only my definitions and my previous and the postulates that I've introduced. But I can do it. Because if you think about it, I've got two triangles here. We'll call them left and right for obvious reasons. Well, they share a side. So that needs to be the same in both of them. And they form right angles here and here. So those are both 90 degree angles. So they've got those angles the same. And it intersected at what we call the midpoint, which made that side equal to that side. So now I've got these two tr congruent triangles that are just flapping like that. And if I've got two congruent triangles, then their corresponding parts are congruent. So I can conclude deductively that that length needs to be the same as that length. And I've just made a, my first small theorem. And with that one, and a similar type theorem that, that I won't go through, but, but through a similar type process, we're now ready to tackle the big ones I wanted to. So here's our less aesthetically pleasing triangle. It's not equilateral, it's just tilted off to the side. But all three of those perpendicular bisectors, two of which I've drawn and one of them I haven't drawn, they all have to intersect at H. And here's how I would deductively prove that given the tools we've had so far. I've just drawn two of them because surely two lines meet someplace and we would have talked about that in class. But now that I've got those two meeting up here, I take a look at this first one and I say, geez, H is on a perpendicular bisector, which means that that distance HA is equal to that distance HB. And this point H is also on this perpendicular bisector, which means that HB is equal in length to HC. So I have concluded deductively that HA is equal to HB and HB is equal to HC. So that means that those end segments have to be the same length. HA has to be equal to HC, because they're all equal. But look where HA goes. It goes to the bottom of this unmarked segment, and C goes to the bottom, or goes to the end point of this unmarked end, if you will. So that means that I've got a point now that is equal distance from that end and that end of this segment, which means that that point H has to fall on the perpendicular bisector if I were to draw it of this side as well. So I should have drawn that other perpendicular bisector and it would have gone through there. But I took two of them and I made conclusions about it. HA equal to HB, HB equal to HC. Therefore I could put those together and say HA equals HC and work into that third bisector backwards. I would take, I would absolutely take questions on that. Um, if you understood 70% of it, we're loving it, and you're going to be able to go on to the next part just fine. So if you sort of appreciated where I was going with that, um, that was really my target. But I'd be delighted to answer any questions as well. Okay, well let's, let's 
crank up Sketchpad and see how fast we can do that same thing. So, uh, if you have, I guess give me an indication that you have this um, student blue page on your screen. Okay. And when you do, there's an icon here at the bottom, right there. It's the yellow circle with the red triangle and the blue circle in there. You're going to want to double click on that. Click, click. And I can help anybody who needs it. Just give me a signal and I'll, I'll get you into that program. Yeah. I think I'm shining right in your, your faces there. Okay. Yep. Great. So far, so good. Um, if we can, what I would suggest doing, you can see my arrow up here, just to make it a little bit larger, I put the arrow down in here in this lower right corner of your, of your sketch pad screen. Press down on the left key and expand the window a little bit just so we can look at the whole thing. Just so we can have a bigger working area. You just Let's draw a triangle in there that we can play with. Uh, we do that by, on the left-hand side, over here, I think the fourth one down is there's a little segment there. So you just want to, you're going to want to bring your arrow over to that and just click down on that portion there. That's going to give you the segment tool. Okay. Now I'm bringing my arrow back into the window and I'm going to left click and drag to the right and marvel that I've just constructed one third of a triangle. I'm going to delete it and do it again. And close your eyes. Okay. I'm going to mark the segment tool there. Bring the arrow into the working area. Left click, drag to make one side of my triangle. It's helpful but not necessary if yours looks like mine with your segment still highlighted in purple and your arrow on the right side, but, but we, can, we can do anything there. In fact, hmm, two routes to go here. Let me make the second side and then I'll come around and help you with that. I still have my segment tool selected, so I'm going, I'm going to go to one end of my first side, until that highlights, it says, oh, you're right on top of that point, left click and form my second side. And let me come around and just help you with that. Highlight it and then delete. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I like mice better.
lines as you want. Yeah. So now I gotta get go. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna finish my triangle. I'm gonna do my arrow on top of there. Left click and bring down here. Boom. I've got my triangle. I'll just come around again and see if you've got a finished triangle. I'm sorry, I got lots of dogs there. But it's just an interesting triangle. I like this. It's just stop. Let's start a new one. I think I better go back to first grade. Okay. Okay, now we'll construct those three perpendicular bisectors and see if they meet. Yeah. So um, you may have one side selected. And if you do, that's great. If not, like now I don't have any of them selected. I go to my arrow. Actually, we should all be on that arrow up here, the pointer. Yeah. So while we probably had the segment selected before from constructing, we now want to go up to this, this arrow part right here. So we're actually. We're doing pretty well here. We've just got to construct three perpendicular bisectors. Yeah. We'll construct the first one. I've got this arrow selected here, so I come and I just select one of the sides. I go up to construct and say, give me a midpoint, because that's the center of that. And the computer does it for me. There's my midpoint. There will be a repetitiveness here after we do this first one. I've got my midpoint. Now I've got to select this side too because I want the perpendicular that goes through this side and this point. So I've selected, because I've got my arrow selected here, I can just click on things. So I've clicked on a side of the triangle. I've clicked on the midpoint that I constructed. I go back up to construct and I say, give me a perpendicular line. So I construct perpendicular line. And boom, there it is. I gotta wipe mine off. Let me do all three of them and then just, just help you. I still have that arrow selected. I select the side of the triangle. I go up to construct. I say, give me the... I select the side of the triangle. Go up to construct. Say, give me the midpoint. With the midpoint selected and that same side, I say, give me a perpendicular line. I then click on the third side of my triangle. I go up to construct. I say, give me the midpoint. That midpoint still selected. And the third side of the triangle selected. I say, give me the perpendicular line. What I'll do, I'm very you know, time sensitive to the work that you guys have to do. So I'll just come around for a minute, see if I can help you do that. Um, but I can give you a slightly abbreviated program as, as well. So I can respond to that as well. Let me take a minute or so, see if you can get that set up. Um, and then we'll appreciate what we have on the, on the computer screen. Yeah, that's better. I'm going to begin starting over. OK, well, that's, that's I just want to type it off okay. by mistake. <laughs> Now, you'll never need to hit any of the rest of these again. So you select one side. Right mm here? -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Go up to construct. Construct. Okay. 
Make the point. And then before you do anything else, click the side, that side. Yeah, yeah click that side. Yeah. And again, construct a perpendicular. Construct a perpendicular line. And you've got your first perpendicular okay. line. Now click somewhere else, just, just to unhighlight everything. And then start that same process on that side, do the same process on that side. Select it, construct midpoint. Select the side, construct perpendicular. Thank you. Are you sure you want to shut down your computer now? This is much better than having a school board meeting. <laughs> no. Cancel. I got that by mistake. <laughs> What's that? Pretty good. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you want to be here to this. Um, <laughs> Let's see, you, yep, select the point, good, now select the same side, select the same side of the triangle. But one thing Now just, uh, oh, I, uh -oh. I'm sorry, you've got to be right, you've got to be selecting that arrow yeah. that's oh, up at the right. top left. Oh, okay, that's right. And then you can click this. Click this. Let's see. Hmm. There you go. So now you can select midpoints and yep. sides. Okay. Yeah. You can just um, select i going to use one finger and delete it. Oh. Oops. Uh, you delete it. Let go of this guy. Oh, you're in great shape. Yeah. Double click. Yep. You're in great shape. Oh, Just going back to my next minute. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> left side of the... Uh, left side of the... Jeffrey, this is a lot better than having a school board meeting. <laughs> Do that three times. Now click over here just so that you're starting fresh. You just click right there so that it unselects everything. And then you're starting fresh. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, How do I get rid of all this? No, 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 okay. Well, let me just, uh, and I we've got a pretty good success right here, but let me just show you essentially what, what, what you've done here, and I'll just change the thickness here a little bit so that you can uh, get the triangle versus the perpendicular bisectors. But now what a student can do is take that, you can see how those three perpendicular bisectors are intersecting right there. And you can then drag that triangle all around, and wherever you move it, I mean, I'm very convinced, just looking at this, in fact, what I like doing is going up to display and animating points, and so you can see that triangle, oops, let's see, you don't want parallel there, come on, there we go, probably slow the speed down a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> but you can see regardless of the shape of the triangle, 
those three perpendicular bisectors are always intersecting. I'm following that point of concurrency around. And boy, if this doesn't do it for you, um, I don't know what will. Oh it's, it's a great visual. You remember it. You probably remember it better than that deductive stuff. But I'll tell you that deductive stuff has meant a lot to me over the years. So it's finding a, uh, a balance between those two. I understand I've got to wrap up. I just, I just want to show you quickly one other thing, uh, one other demonstration. Um, so what you should do is, uh, I think the only thing you need to do is double click on this Pythagorean dissection over here. Just give that two clicks. That's something that the um, Sketchpad people wrote. And what it is, it's, it's on the Pythagorean theorem, which is, it's probably one of our favorite theorems that people remember, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And I had an overhead that showed the deductive process. That was my December proof, because it would take several months of learning postulates and making small theorems and bigger theorems and bigger change to be able to prove the Pythagorean theorem. But I take something like this, and this is a squared. This green shape is the length a, but I've made a square out of it, so that's a squared. And this side b is a length, and I've made a square out of it, so that's b squared. What I've got to figure out whether is those two areas match this area here. And if I want to, if I want to demonstrate it for myself, I just hit move b squared. And then I hit move a squared. And you know what? I've just accomplished in about 15 seconds what would have taken four months worth of classwork to do. I'm not sure that's a, I mean, I think you're missing something there too, perhaps, when you do it that fast. Um, but there it is. So it's an incredibly powerful tool. You just have to sh show restraint a little bit. Um, I, I'll probably leave it there. I, I think I've okay. accomplished what I was hoping to do, just leave you thinking about this stuff a little bit. So um, I appreciate your time, and I'll just come around and help you log out of this thing and get you moving on with your business. Thank you. There we are. laptops with your students in your class? Uh, we have a, uh, a mobile lab that has 10 of these in it um, that I've had very good access to. It's available for any teachers to sign out and sometimes more than one teacher wants it. But generally, if I want to use it, it's, it's available. Uh, it, it, they're good to use during our longer periods, our 85 minute periods. Um, so with the 10 and you have a, a class size of 20 or so, there you've got partners helping each other and... Well, great question. The freshmen actually all have, have. Yep. So I teach some classes that maybe have four or five sophomores in them. Mm -hmm. So I'll make sure I have the cart for the sophomores and the freshmen bring their computers. And bring in there so you can... Okay. Right? Hey, I can get out of show. I would come to you with a computer book. <laughs> I don't that very much. Hi. <laughs> These are so I just learned, but that's okay. Next, <laughs> so we could have done it. Yeah, <laughs> I see that. But it's not. So here, why, why have the bright lights gone out? While we're waiting, um, I'd like to thank Evan for a, a really dynamite presentation. It was very timely for us as we just before this meeting discussed funding laptops. So uh, I appreciate it. Very cool.
Thanks for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we take the laptops home? I know. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do when you know what button to push. Isn't I it? just want the software. <laughs> um, I think we'll, we can move on while Evan's taking care of that. Um, to Nancy Hutton in the middle school report. I really like that dancing correct theorem <laughs> thing. That was great. I think that's what I needed for my geometry class when I was a student. Well, good evening. Um, first thing I wanted to do is to just um, publicly thank Gary Lenoy and his crew that is in helping us this week as we do our MEA online. We ran into a glitch yesterday of not being able to close out tests, which meant you couldn't go on to the next test. But Gary and his very capable crew um, helped us problem solve that with a few calls to measured progress. Um, our sixth grade helped be flexible with the eighth grade so we could swap some lunch periods. Um, the eighth grade teachers and, pro and test proctors were um, exhibiting great extents of perseverance as they entertained students for about a 30 minute break while we got the test back online. And we moved forward and we did get all of our writing prompts done yesterday. Um, after many calls to pre measured progress, Gary and I are assuming because of the response they gave us that the problem we had with the test was one that was bigger than Cape Elizabeth Middle School because they rewrote some of the software last night and re-entered that on our computer. So um, they did that and today the test went fine. But um, certainly having Gary and his crew there, I think it's an example of an opportunity that the state gives us in many things, whether it be the MEA online or whatever. But if we didn't have Gary and Paul and Jason and then our own um, Holly Smevog up on those floors with people it would be very, very difficult because what they did is they offered that support and reassurance to our testing proctors, who are our teachers, that we actually could do this and move forward. And um, we look forward to the continuing adventure with MEA Online. Once we're into MEA Online, you can't back out. So we are moving forward. It's a great opportunity to demonstrate new learning on our feet. But what I really wanted to talk with you tonight, just to bring you up to date uh, very briefly, I know my colleagues down there paid me extra money to be very brief, um, so I appreciate <laughs> the donation, the, uh, is to tell you a little bit about the work that we're doing in the middle school this year. I came to you earlier this year and explained we were really going to try to work on changing the atmosphere, the climate in our building, respect, caring, getting to know one another, less bullying. We haven't eradicated bullying or anything like that, um, but we have been working on it very consciously and very openly couple, in a couple of ways. Our community building days, which Nora mentioned, um, that we're having our third one on March 31st. Our first one, September 1st, went really well, getting to know you first day of school. By the time we got to December 6th, I think as I shared with you earlier, uh, most of my colleagues in the middle school were pretty sure this was somebody's horrible idea, and it was mine. And why did we ever have it? Um, we moved on. We, we did the day. It actually went quite well. Once again, it's around activities and get this, getting the students to talk with one another during those activities to get to know each other. And then on March 31st, we decided to change from the first day of the trimester to the 31st, which is an early release day for us for family conferences, because the one consistent feedback we were getting is these days are good, but they're a little long. Well, the whole idea of doing them actually, um, other events throughout our world have helped us come and think about this, and it's about thinking beyond yourself. And certainly the horrific um, tsunami that affected part of our world um, gave a time for one of our advisory groups to say, hey, if we're building community and caring about community, what about the world community? So off went Hat Day, which you have heard about, and doing that. From that, then the, some of the seventh grade advisory groups remembered, hey, wait a minute, we're doing this great thing with Project Smile with the high school group, Bethany Roy's group at the high school, um, and they had the seventh grade advisories had taken that on earlier this year. Is any money we fundraise for, we're going to give to Project Smile. So they've decided to sell refreshments during the basketball games that are after school events so that they could do that. But when they saw the great success with Hat Day for the tsunami, they said, let's have a Hat Day for Project Smile. Once again, it didn't interrupt the entire day. It was a way for the middle school students to show we can care about other people beyond ourselves and yet meet a need that we kind of enjoy. 
Now, they didn't raise as much money as we did for the tsunami, but they raised a significant amount, I think about $1,000, um, that they were able to give to Project SMILE. And those are really the kinds of things we're hoping some of this will be, so that in the future it isn't always about a whole day that we take to do that, but it becomes a habit, a way of life that we think beyond um, to the world, and then even beyond ourselves, so that if I'm walking down the hall, trip and spill all of my books, that somebody will help me pick them up. And that's really what it's about. All the research and things that we've done, and looking at a lot of the people that do work on this, what is consistent with them is that the adults who work with young people need to be present in their spaces and in their areas, and they need to be consistent and send the constant message. Our sixth grade team has worked on this all year by talking about in homeroom guidance groups about bullying and about taking pledges and about really addressing it. The guidance counselor, Kim Sturgeon, who does work with them, has also extended some of her work into those homeroom guidance groups. Our fifth graders talk about it when they meet. The advisory groups do. We have other groups in the middle school that connect to this, our civil rights team. They have a very um, interesting bulletin board that they put up that they ask us to think about other people. They're always trying to think of ways to make themselves more visible in the building. Our student council, one of the things they have done is adop adopted an orphanage in Africa, which I think you've heard Nora and Elsa talk about during their reports a couple of times this year. So they're really trying to go beyond. They do a great job with the way beyond. The harder one is the immediate the person next to me in the hallway. A couple of things that we've noticed. We have noticed that as we have called more attention to this, um, we have driven some of this more underground. That is not an uncommon thing that would happen, meaning that they don't do any of this in front of any adult. Any adult, whether it's an eighth grade teacher, or, and I'm in the fifth grade or whatever, any of those adult type people, I, don't, I behave well when I'm there and I'm respectful to all people just helps us remember we need to be in all of those spaces and be more visible and be more consistent. It is a progression of development. I think we're working on this. This is something, this is a goal we will work on for a long, long time. I think in our society, and we have to admit that in our culture, to a degree, promotes and accepts speaking only for yourself and only looking out for yourself. So what we're trying to do is those things are important, but it is also important to remember not only the person who lives on the other side of the world, but the person who sits right beside you in class as well, too. But I think everyone is, the program is alive and well. It's not razzle-dazzle. It's not award-winning. It's not anything like that. It's a slow, gradual, consistent progression to doing things better than we have in the past. And that's what I wanted to bring to you tonight. Thank you. Any questions for Nancy? I was just curious when we were sitting there, and I don't know that you can answer this now, but um, I think we've had, we haven't had DARE for two years. And I know that, to some extent, impacted the, with some of the lessons that you're teaching in terms of environment and community were taught through the DARE program. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if now that we haven't had it for two years, if we could sort of take a look at what impact, if any, its absence has had. I think we, we could, and I will tell you right off, um, the most observational one that we did is the, what we felt was the most valuable part of D.A.R.E., and that was that our students in the middle school began to make a connection with our police force that was friendly, that was open, that was caring, that this was a person who was interested in sledding, that was doing things. I got to know the person as a person before I got my license and maybe ran into some other difficulties with him. We no longer have that. Um, Mark Dorval, who is the new community liaison officer, did come to our December 6th workshop and spent the day with the fifth graders, and they all rotate, rotated in to see him. But it's not like when we had Paul Gaspar there, and they really got to know who Officer Gaspar was. Um, other things we can pick up, building that relationship with other members of our community, if they're not present in our school, is something we have lost. Thank you. And Nancy, I just want to say, I, I hope that you know the information that you gain through these three days, it's three days, right, these community yes. building days, will be somehow you know, um, captured formally so that with your imminent departure, you know, the information that 
that the school has gained from doing those can sort of be carried on to the next administrator so that it won't get. Well, you know, there's an interesting thing about that because several times you people have implied that somehow I have all this knowledge and I'm, it's going to go away. The great thing about being in a middle school is the knowledge doesn't reside with me. It resides with all of my colleagues that are in the middle school who are going to be there. So all of this will be there. Now, these three days, they may, may remember as that horrid idea that Nancy had. And, but it will be translated into something else. The things we accomplished in those three days, those colleagues will keep that. They will keep moving forward that. I think even the students will understand to some degree that those are kinds of things and behaviors that we want to do. So it doesn't reside with me and it isn't about me. It's really with them. Um, they're still going to be here, alive and well. And um, I bet all of these ideas and even better ideas will be here as well. Thank you, Nancy. With that, we'll move on to committee reports, and we'll begin uh, with Kathy Ray and the activities of the Finance Committee. Um, I won't repeat what Bob had said, so we're not going over that again, but um, the Finance Committee met before uh, this meeting this evening where we signed warrants and reviewed appropriations reports. Um, we also reviewed the Food Service Task Force report um, at this point in time, in, as of February, our negative student accounts now stand at $6,995.69. And um, we have sent uh, a group of accounts, holder accounts, to collection. I believe the amount was about 4500 Is that correct, Pauline? $4,800 has been sent to collection, and we're looking forward to getting a report from them next month. Um, we also uh, received notification from MSMA um, on an unemployment trust refund, which of course I can't find. But um, there we go. Um, we annually re receive a return from them. Um, and this is the MSMA Unemployment Compensation Trust Fund. Um, this year, they're telling us they're going to we're going to receive an excess of $9,579. Um, we are waiting to uh, put together another budget meeting, possibly between now and March 22nd. Otherwise, March 22nd will be our next budget committee meeting. Questions? Did I miss something? Thank you. And policy subcommittee. Our policy committee met today. We got snowed out of our meeting that was to be scheduled that was scheduled last week. Um, mainly, we're just continuing our um, journey of plotting through the policy book. And later this evening, we're going to be presenting. Um, policies for second reading. So I won't go through the details of what we discussed. The only other thing I would like to add is that the Middle School Allergy Task Force did meet and we completed the task of revising, developing the Middle School Allergy um, Management Guidelines. So those are now in force and I'd like to thank Bonnie Steinroder and Dorothy Stack, two middle school parents, for helping with that process. Thank you, Ann. Trish, will you be taking communications or? We haven't met since our last meeting. Our next scheduled meeting is next Wednesday, March 16th at 3.15 in the Pond Cove Media Center. Thank you. And on personnel committee, I'm pleased to tell you that we have three finalists in our superintendent search. That is all I can tell you at this point. We will be meeting in executive session this evening, uh, as soon as this meeting ends, to discuss our next steps in finalizing uh, a decision. On to unfinished business, which is primary policies, primarily policies, and Okay, we're going to be presenting um, the Section B of the policy manual, that's board governance. Um, for second reading, the, it, um, the bulk of the B policies, there are a few other B policies that um, the board is going to be looking at that will be added to the B policies later this year. 
Um, so I, b before I make a motion to look at these, I guess we're going to do these one by one just so that people can know which exact policies we're referring to. And um, also, just so the board knows, because we didn't have our policy committee last week, we had it today, there are some changes to the B policies that were um, made today. They're not in the packet, so I'm going to have to read them to you. Okay. So. Um, so in order to open the discussion, I'd like to make a motion that we um, accept policy BCA, School Board Code of Ethics. Do we have a second? Elaine, thank you. Well, uh, any questions or comments? I want to comment that there's nothing on this policy that's been changed from the first reading last month. All in favor? 6-0. The next one here, BCB, Board Member Conflict of Interest, I think we discussed that last month. That was actually not supposed to be in there because there were no changes made to this. So no action needs to be taken on that. Or the next one, BCC. The next policy is policy BDE board committees. And I'd like to move that we accept this policy as presented here. Second. Thank you, Trish. Discussion? Okay, so for the purpose of, yeah, 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 this is one of the ones um, that there is a change. Um, so I don't know if I did that right by moving that we. Oh yeah. I, I don't know how. How do you do that? I mean, my understanding is that we have to move it to open discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So. And then amend it. Okay. Um. So under B. Um. No, I'm sorry. Under A, we would like to add the following sentence. The board shall identify membership structure. So that, that's a, a second sentence to A. And then another change is um, on C. We'd like to add the sentence to C that would read, the committee may recommend changes regarding issues under its charge. Could you say that again, Ann? This would be the second sentence of C. Yeah. The committee may recommend changes regarding issues under its charge. Did we cross out the first sentence? Of no, no, we're keeping the first sentence. B? No, no in B. In, in, C, in C. And if I remember right, these were both suggestions at the last, at the first reading. They were. Yeah. So is everybody clear? Those are the two changes that we'd like to, that came out of the committee today. Any questions or anything on that? Did, did we do something with B? We crossed out the first sentence, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Right. The committee, the, yeah, B would only read the committee chair shall be appointed by the school board chair. So you did cross out the first sentence. We did cross out the first sentence, yeah. right, Bob? I think we did. Yeah, I think we did too. Sorry, yeah. Wait Henry, what then. first sentence? The first sentence of B. The committee member shall be appointed by the board chair? Yeah, that's, that's right. Out. Yeah, yeah. So yes, because... So we it's put the committee the board chair. Shall identify membership structure in it. Yeah. yeah, instead of. Instead of. You. That's not what it reads. Okay. If that's your intent, then you're going to have to clarify the language. So the way. By saying the board IDs the structure, the way I'm reading it is that the board would um, determine that it's going to be two school board members, two parents, two this, two that, two the other things. 
Okay. Well, the members, that's not the same as appointing the members. That's just a composition of positions, mm -hmm. which is fine, if my understanding of that is correct, if that's mm -hmm. what it's intended to say. Mm -hmm. But then who appoints the members? It should be the board, the whole board. Under A, the... Shouldn't it be the whole board that appoints the members? Right, because that's that process that we go through at the beginning when we... It's, historically, that's been the chair's prerogative. And if it's your desire to change that... No, I don't think that that was a desire. Mostly what we were sort of focusing on when we were discussing this was committees such as the communication committee that has members outside the board. So maybe in coming up with that um, second sentence of A, maybe we need to not cross out B or, you know, that first sentence of B. I mean, I see your point, Kevin, and I think, you're, yeah, that was, there's two different aspects I'm of just this. trying to yeah. clarify your intent. I'm, right. I'm not objecting. No, I know. To what I you're think doing. I don't, there, go ahead. I'm I don't have any notes, so we crossed out that first sentence. Yeah, this was, but you weren't there today. Okay, then I agree with Kevin. I, I think we need to define who appoints the committee members, mm -hmm. whether it's the chair or the school board, but it's right now it's too vague. As I recall, the, the com conversation last month was um, raised by Rebecca as to, well, what about all the committees that have non-school board members? Mm -hmm. And my response to that was what I believe to be a very practical, provide me with a list of names and I'll appoint them. Okay, well, that would be another, hmm, okay. So what we had talked about today was just that the board would identify the membership structure, such as, you know, we will, we'd like one, one administrator from each school, and we would like an administrator to find one staff person in each school, and that we would leave it up to them. That's fine. So if we leave the first sentence of B and the last sentence of B, should be fine. But if they, if they use that first sentence, yeah. Right. So I think that's the piece kept. If we should leave in that first sentence, would be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. I think that we need to have this clarified before we're trying to vote on it because. Yeah, I know I, it's confusing because we don't because we met today. It's not typed in here in the right way. I think it. Table it to the next meeting. I think yeah, it needs to be tabled. I, I move that it be tabled. Okay next month. Is that a motion? I think somebody has to yeah. second my motion. I will, I will second that we table this in, uh, after another policy meeting. Okay. The next is uh, policy BE, school board meetings. There are no... We have to vote on that table. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. All in favor of tabling... Uh, BDE six zero. The next is policy BE school board meetings. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the policy as presented here. A second. Trish, thank you. Discussion. There are, there, are no, there are no changes in this from the first reading. Any, discuss, any other discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Policy BEA, school board use of electronic mail. I move that we adopt this policy as presented here. Second. Lane, thank you. Discussion? There are no changes in this policy from the first reading. Other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? 6-0. Policy uh, BEC, executive session. Um, I move that we 
replace the exit. Can I do this? I move that we replace the existing BEC with the sample policy as written here. Can I do that all in one motion? Mm -hmm. Second. Thank you, Trish. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? 6 0. BECE Executive Session Law. This is an exhibit, so we don't have to vote on this, right? No. That's right. Okay, this next one is also one that we made some changes to today, and um, I don't know. I'm just wondering if it's going to be too complicated to read the changes here, and that we might just put this off to next time. Would that be easier? What changes are there? Uh, just a couple, but. Which one are we talking about now? BEDB -E 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 -E. agenda. Okay. Well, why don't you tell us what the changes are, and then we can let you know if it needs to be tabled. Okay. Can I tell them the changes without no. opening? No. Go ahead and open the discussion. Okay. All right. So I move then that we adopt policy BEDB -E as presented here. Second. Thank you, Trish. Discussion, Anne. Okay. The change is in. Um, under agenda preparation and dissemination, second paragraph. This was something that came out of the first reading last time when we discussed, um, you know, where announcements would be posted. We wanted to um, insert the word, well, this is second sentence, second paragraph. Copies of the agenda will be posted minimally on the website and in town hall. Actually, that's the only change. It's the only change, yep. I move without that. That's the only change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> After all that. <laughs> Is there any, any, any discussion of the change? No. Seeing none, all in favor? You have vote two. Six zero. Um, Sorry, go ahead, Ian. All right, the next one is policy BEDG minutes. There are no, well. Yeah, it sounds like Maybe snowed in. So I move that we adopt this as presented here. Yep. A second. Thank you, Trish. Discussion? Any changes since last month, Ann? No. Thank you. All in favor? 6-0. Policy BEDH, public participation at board meetings. I move that we delete this. And do you want to go on and replace it with the... Replace it with the, the T and new BEDH. E D H. <laughs> there's a beyond the B E D H R. There's a new B E D H. Right. So we need to replace it with that one. The second. What What are we seconding yeah. now? So, so you need a motion just to replace one for <coughs> the other. Then we'll have discussion on the new. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I move that we. Replace. I need a second. I think Ann already mo made the motion to. Okay. Yeah, second. Elaine, second. So Elaine seconds. Okay, Discussion. there is. There is a change on um, B. We want to add. This came out of the first reading. Speakers are are to identify themselves by name and address. We're adding an and address. And then we're taking out the last sentence. Board members wishing to address the speaker are asked to direct their comments to the board chairperson. And we're putting the T in meetings. 
and we're the top putting the t in participation yeah. in title in meetings in meetings in the word meeting in meetings Participate. No other discussion? In that case, all in favor? 6 0. Next is policy BG, board policy development. And I'd like to move that we delete our existing policy and replace it with the sample policy provided. Mm -hmm. Second. Thank you, Elaine. Discussion? And we made no changes to that from the first reading. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? 6-0. Policy BGB, policy adoption and amendment. Uh, I'd like to move that we delete this at this time. Any replacement, Dan? There's, um, it overlaps with BGR procedures. Okay. Second, please. Thank you, Trish. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Six zero. And next are the guidelines, BG dash R policy adoption amendment procedures, but we don't need to um, vote on this, right? Because they're guidelines. guidelines. And we didn't make any changes in that in the first. <coughs> and the last is BIA new board member orientation. I move that we adopt this policy as presented here. Second. Second. Thank you, Elaine. Discussion? There are no additional changes from the first reading and from what you see. Other discussion? All in favor? 6 0. Before we move into. You have two more policies. Yes, before we move into memorial events. I'd like to remind the public that an extraordinary amount of work goes into the policies before they arrive at this point and that you are not seeing just a rubber stamp of a series of policies. There are very active discussions led by Ann and uh, we are all aware of uh, those discussions. In advance, the policy committee meetings are always public events. Sorry, Ann, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, then um, the next is policy FFA memorial events. And I'd like to move that we adopt this policy as presented here. A second. Thank you, Elaine. Discussion? All in favor? Six zero. The last policy is FFAA Memorial Scholarships and Gifts. And I'd like to move that we adopt this policy as presented. Second. Thank you, Elaine. All in favor? Uh, discussion? All in favor? Six zero. I believe. That brings us to the end of old business and on into number 12, new business. Bob? Yes. Um, we're recommending the uh, following high school um, spring coaching position, uh, people to fill positions. Uh, they are all returning coaches. Tom Tinsman, JV Baseball, Terry Long, JV Boys Lacrosse, Doug Worthley, Assistant Track, Mark Joyce, assistant track. Paul Snyder, assistant track. Um, and for the middle school, um, new coaching nominations, uh, Alisa Anderson, seventh grade <coughs> softball. Doug Donovan, eighth grade baseball. Amy Matthews, spring track. And returning coaches, Steve Martin, eighth grade softball. 
Gazella Eubanks, 8th grade girls lacrosse, Jim Dovener, 8th grade boys lacrosse, Steve Donovan, 7th grade baseball, and Ann Carney, 7th grade girls lacrosse. Can I have a motion? I move that we accept uh, the superintendent's recommendation for uh, the athletic uh, coaching positions for the spring. Second. Thank you, Trish. All in favor? Discussion? Any uh, favor. impact on the budget? No, they're all budgeted positions. Thank you. All in favor? Six zero. The next item is consideration of proposal from the class of 59 to donate a granite bench. That's the earlier presentation. And uh, I'd like a motion to accept this gift contingent on satisfactory placement with Bob Malley's department. And they have, as she said, have already discussed that with him and are working with him. But yes, that should be fine. Someone make that motion? So moved. Thank you, Ann. <laughs> a second? Thank you, Elaine. Any discussion? All in favor? Six zero. Thank you to them uh, because I, it's really neat that you know. And in the meantime, our thanks for the class to the class of fifty nine. Yeah, it'd be great to have an article. And is there going to be another? Is there another view coming out? Uh, not this month, but yes. <laughs> 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 I mean, that would be a really nice article. Yeah. Um, it's good, I do think. The next item is consideration of the proposed process for hiring a new middle school principal. Bob? Yes. Um, in your packet was a an outline of a, a uh, process. Um, an advertisement did appear in the main Sunday Telegram on February 27th seeking applicants. Um, it's also on our websites and on two other hiring websites, I believe. It's on the Portland Press Herald website and on servingschools.com. Right. Um, the applicants, uh, potential applicants, have until Friday, March 18th to complete applications and submit them. I'm suggesting the following composition for a 10 member search committee two administrators from the DLT. John Casey, two middle school staff members, two middle school parents appointed by the uh, Middle School Parent Association, two school board members, and the superintendent. That committee would read applications, narrow the first round interviews, conduct those interviews, check references, and further narrow to finalists. Finalists would then interview with expanded committees of staff, parents, school board members, and possibly students giving feedback to the original search committee. The original search committee will arrange site visits and make a recommendation to the school board, uh, actually to the superintendent and the school board. A rough timeline for that process is laid out there. Um, February 27th, we advertised. March 18th, applications are due. Week of March 21st, search committee reads applications. Week of March 28th, search committee meets and narrows the field for first interviews. Week of April 4th, first interviews and further narrow the field. Uh, then we have a vacation week in there before week of April 25th, site visits and decision with a recommendation probably coming to the board on May 10th. You can never be sure if there's um, a glitch of some kind, um, but that would be a recommended you know, um, timetable for the search. But question. Um, is this our, our normal process for hiring administ administrators? I don't know what your normal process is, okay. to be very honest. Um, I think it's a great process, actually. I, I like it. And I just, um, I haven't been involved in the hiring of an administrator. No, I don't think point. so. It, hmm? It's, um, 
it seems to me that it, it's made up of a representation of, of parents and even students and other administrators. Um, is there going to be a chair or somebody who will drive the, will it be the superintendent? Yes. It would be. Yeah. The, the hiring of all administrators falls under the purview of the superintendent, so he is by essentially de facto chair of that committee. The only thing I can point out to my best recollection is that in the past, the entire school board has been involved somewhere along the line in the interview process. However, that has just been a practice as we in fact have uh, no say in who is presented as a candidate to us. Mm -hmm. So this was a compromise to continue board um, participation in this process, um, but recognizing that it is, in fact, the superintendent's process. If I can add one other piece. Hopefully, before we get down to the last stages of this, we have an, a, a nominee for superintendent. Um, and I would want to try to include that person in the process um, mm -hmm. as well, um, if we are there. Yes, Trish. Just a quick question. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, first, thanks, Bob, for putting this together. And I guess sort of as a follow-up, just um, thinking back on what one of our um, com community members mentioned um, about the superintendent search, I'm wondering if you feel strongly about a 10-member search committee, if that's too big well, it's, um, to push about, the process it's forward. About half, it's about half the size of... Uh, yeah. the committee that he was referring to, so I'm not overly concerned about it. Um, and I think that just as we're finding with the school board, some people will not be there every time, and we have to move on and schedule things and do them with the majority of the board and trust that the majority of that group um, takes reasonable steps. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adopting the process? Six zero. The next item is consideration of school board volunteers to serve on the middle school principal search committee. I'd like to suggest that since we just passed a policy which um, vests in the chairperson the authority to appoint those members that we determine who's willing to volunteer and I will make an appointment um, sometime before the end of the, the appointments before the end of the week. Is that acceptable? We didn't pass that policy, Kevin. Oh, that's we right, we did that one. But that means no. that we're probably operating under our current, current process. Which still allows our current policy. the chair, the, poli uh, the appointive policy. So who's interested in serving on this? So we have three. I knew that would happen. I think about it. Um, I'll talk to each of you uh, during the week, and we'll make a decision. That works. I'll talk with ELP and uh, get things out to the uh, the parent group and others. Great. Final item. You didn't discuss this, did you, earlier? Okay. Consideration of request from a teacher for a one-year leave of absence for child rearing. The earlier one was a maternity leave? It was a maternity leave okay. at the end of this year. Right. And that's because that comes under medical leave and whatever, there's no action needed right. on that. We're, um, this is Megan Crabtree, who is um, um, expecting a baby this August and she is requesting a one-year leave of absence, which is different than just a maternity leave. Right. So um, I do recommend that you grant this. Um, I think it's good practice, so, but, you know, that's your choice. Yes. And for those of you who don't know Megan, she's one of our fifth grade teachers. She's a team teacher with Kathy Walsh this year. Uh, Megan Crabtree, I believe, is completing her third year with us. Um, I would say to you, um, unequivocally, she is one of the most outstanding 
young teachers I've ever seen. And if we could grant her this and uh, keep the possibility of her returning to Cape Elizabeth Middle School, it would only strengthen our program. Thank you. I'd like to move that we accept the superintendent and principal's recommendation for granting uh, the one-year leave of absence to Megan Grab Crabtree. Thank you. A second. Thank second. you, Trish. Henry. We'll put Henry on the record yes, for this one. I second something tonight. Any discussion? She'll just be sorely missed, but I wish her the best of luck. Yeah. All those in favor? Six zero. Uh, we are back to the comment, public comment section. One last opportunity, and I see no members of the public here. So I think we can move on to school board agenda requests. Are there any um, members who've had a uh, request rejected? I guess not. Announcement of upcoming meetings. It was good of you to put this on the agenda because you knew I would forget, right? <laughs> Dates to remember. Communication Committee, Wednesday, March 16th, 2005, 2005, 3.15 p.m. Pond Cove Media Center. School Board Workshop and Special Meeting, Tuesday, March 22nd, 2005, High School Library, 7 p.m. Primary topic. 2005-06 budget. School board policy subcommittee meeting Tuesday, April 5th, 2005, if it's not snowed out. Noon, William H. Jordan conference room. Finance subcommittee meeting April 12th, 2005, 7 p.m. William H. Jordan conference room, followed by regular school board meeting, 7.30 in council chambers. And finally, presentation of school budget to Town Council Finance Committee, April 13th, 2005, 7.30, Council Chambers. Um, Two more that we mentioned earlier, Kevin. Calendar Committee is right now scheduled for March, Tuesday, March 29th, 3.15 in the Jordan Conference Room. And the Personnel Committee um, is scheduled for an executive session um, on April 1st from 9 to 10 in the morning. That's right. And we also have a co-curriculum meeting on the March 15th. 315? 315? Yes. On the 15th. Where is that going to be, Bob? Uh, co-curricular meeting is Jordan. Jordan Conference. Co-curricular meeting March 15th, 315, and the William Jordan Conference Room. I think that does it for meetings. Finally, item number 16, um, consideration of a proposal to enter executive session to consider a personnel issue related to the superintendent search pursuant to, and I still haven't learned how to read these citations, but the legal citation is here and available to the public at their request. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Give it to Trish. Oh, well, we'll let Henry do it again. That's twice, Henry. Twice. Okay. Twice all right. All, uh, any discussion? Let's make it fast. All in favor? Thank Six you. Six zero. We, we will not be returning to public session. <laughs>